In November of 2017, I had the opportunity to talk to two different groups of college students about a couple different things, and I went to the Art Institute in Austin and then also to Austin Community College, and what I talked about was sales, talked about education, and then I also talked about multimedia production. My background, I have an undergraduate degree from Purdue in communications, also have an RTF master's degree from University of Texas, and then also have a MBA from Concordia University, Texas. And I've spent some time teaching. I was an instructional aide to a video production class at Concordia University, Texas, and then I also taught the production class as a adjunct professor one semester. And in September of 2016, I started to substitute teach. I've substitute taught in 12 different schools and currently work for the Austin Classical Academy as an instructional aide. So my experience, B2B, business to business sales, also B2C, business to consumer sales. Done video production in undergrad. I took two production classes, TV basics, then an advanced editing class. Also took production classes when I was at University of Texas in 2009. My wife and I formed a general partnership and started doing high definition weddings. Also have done sales videos as well. So it's a couple different kinds of media production that I do. Social media, been active on everything since, probably since MySpace. I skipped Friendster, but then started in with MySpace and, of course, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And I have skills and expertise in networking, also in referrals. If there's something that I can't do or don't know how to do, I can find somebody pretty quickly uh, that does have the skill that I'm looking for or has the resource that somebody comes to me looking for. Here's a little bit of employment history. So Concordia University, I was there on the instructional technology staff from 2000 until 2005. Then I left when I was working on my master's work at UT. And when I was wrapping up at UT, I went to work for Texas Media Systems, selling Canon, Sony, JBC. And these products were sold to individuals, to individual filmmakers, producers, wedding videographers, churches. And also some of these sales were to government and state entities as installations. Went to a very similar company. Omega Broadcast in September of 2012, and that job had a little bit more of a marketing focus that was built into my job description, and left there after I got my MBA in May of 2015 to go downtown to work for a startup, so I was able to do the, the ping pong and flip-flop things in a, in a high-rise in downtown Austin for about six months, and then I went to a different company, also downtown, a technology company, Other World Computing, and I was with them for about six months. And then after that, I decided to go back to working for a dealer. So I'm currently working for Videotex Systems, which is very similar to Texas Media Systems, also to Omega Broadcast, but I'm a straight commission outside sales rep. And the fourth job in the past uh, two years is the Classical Academy. So that's where I'm an instructional aide. It's a K through eight school, about 200 students. So I sub if there's a teacher who's out. If there's no teachers out, then I pull groups for math and then also for reading as well. So as a sales consultant with Videotech Systems, I'm always asking the question, what are people upgrading to? What are people using and why? So it's not always a situation that somebody has to go out and buy something. That's not the solution all the time, but to look at what they have access to and then look at how they can augment or change what they're doing with it, whether it's training, whether it's staffing, and then reach their goals. So what do they have? What do they want to do? And where are they going? Education. I am an instructional aide, as I said, for the third time, and worked through the Texas Teachers Alternative Certification Program. So started that in February of 2017, and it was a cohort that met face-to-face, -face, and then we also had classes that we took online, needed to do 30 hours of observations, and I got all that wrapped up in the springtime. Before summer started, I was done working through my Texas teacher's requirements. As a content producer and doing production, my wife and I's general partnership is called Three Point Production. So we do event video, industrial video, and then also forum contribution. So DVX user, DV info, and Creative Cow used to be a big one for years, but not as big anymore, are places where 
I shoot and edit video on specific cameras using specific camera settings and put media online for people to download to see the video, to put the video into their own system, and then to begin to manipulate it and have a conversation about what works, what doesn't. Some lessons learned. I've talked a lot here kind of about vocation lessons so far, but there's also life lessons that people will come across at all stages of life. Landscaping. I like to do landscaping, but I never be fast enough to get paid to do it. I can also kind of say that for construction work. So drywall, insulation, painting, it's okay doing it. And I like doing it at my own pace, but I'd never be fast enough to get paid to do it. Another example, my Uncle Paul had a clutch on his Toyota pickup that he replaced one year, and what he realized that experience was that he probably would never want to do that again, and he's willing to pay somebody to perform the work of a mechanic on his vehicle. So basically, he's willing to pay somebody to perform for him. Radio Mike, if you're toiling in obscurity, stop toiling. In 2000, like 2006, 2007, I started doing a podcast with a guy named Radio Mike, did about 15 episodes, and it was a music and a music news show. So what I would play is music that was from his library, and then I'd also add a couple of CDs of my own. I'd play three songs, talk about the songs, and I really tried not to use a lot of humor. When I had done student media at the University of Texas as a DJ at KVRX Austin, I used quite a bit of humor. And one of the tasks that I had when that I gave myself, actually, when I was working with Radio Mike, was to have a serious show. And what ended up happening was, put a lot of work into it, there were some listeners, I think I have a graphic online somewhere about how listenership had increased uh, kind of in my time there and could see a little spike in, in, in listening when I had posted a show. But what I realized was that there really wasn't going to be any type of uh, career in podcasting uh, with Radio Mike. There wasn't really going to be any, any revenue stream or business model for it. So what I realized that I was really toiling and was an obscurity. So you should just kind of just stop toiling and kind of be obscure. So do podcasts when you see fit uh, as you want to, uh, but definitely don't toil over them. Dilbert has a concept of a diversified happiness portfolio. So many people know the comic strip Dilbert. He works in an office, all the different things that happen. But his main point with that is there should be lots of different things in your life that you're able to derive happiness from because everything that you're doing is not going to make you happy all the time. Some things are going to make you upset, but there's always got to be several different things that uh, you have going so you don't have this sense of of nothing's working and nothing is going uh, nothing's going well the way to do that is to invest time in several different things and to look at uh, what you're doing and and what you're working on to build those things up because you're not really sure which one of them is going to kind of be successful or if it's going to be something that you derive a paycheck from or even if it's something as simple as as a hobby so hobbies are for rich people right Well, that's not actually the case. Expensive hobbies are for rich people, but doing things that you derive enjoyment from, if it is a hobby, is something that is for everybody. How do you know if you're successful doing any of this? What does customer satisfaction look like in each of these realms? At Videotex, when I am selling things, there's feedback that you get from people. There's customers that are happy uh, with your work, and there's ratings and reviews that are on equipment listings, or there are equipment loans that you get from marketing departments at manufacturers. For instance, I borrowed cameras from Sony, borrowed cameras from Panasonic, borrowed cameras from Canon. There's actually a program, it's called the Canon Explorers of Light. These are professional photographers who are kind of quote-unquote ringers who are able to use Canon equipment to the advantage of both themselves and also to the manufacturer. 
Olympus has the Trailblazers, uh, Lumix has the uh, Luminaries, and Sony has the Artisans is what they are. And marketing support from employer would mean I've been able to travel in my career to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, National Association of Broadcasters Convention, uh, Wedding Portrait and Photographers International Conference, been to the Sundance Film Festival, uh, been to New Orleans to shoot video, been to been to Orlando, Florida to shoot videos. So these different places I've been able to travel all has support from my employer to go do that. Education, you know you're successful as a teacher when there's feedback from students, if there's additional opportunities. So if you're tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, we're wondering if you can go take a look at this and do this, that is something that means that you have been successful in your environment and you're being asked to, to do other responsibilities that not everybody's being asked to do. And I see that as a as a form of of success and that the customers that I am serving are happy. Content is successful when there's lots of views, when there's lots of comments, when you have networking opportunities, when you have referrals. I posted a video about a year ago around Christmas time. It was of a tree lighting ceremony down in San Antonio. So the Christmas lights all came up. Just a couple weeks ago, I had somebody from Germany that emailed me and asked me about the file architecture on the cards. The folders that are set up by the camera that the camera records video into had a question about what those look like. And I said that the files that I posted online were the exact files from the media card in the camera. What is success? In sales, it's income. I am a straight commission sales rep right now, so I do not make any money if I am not selling. Success is also being seen as a trusted advisor. What does it look like? How do I measure it? Something that I'm always thinking about, and it gets back a little bit to Dilbert to, to driving happiness from it, also being able to pay the electric bill, being able to pay for water and trash service, education. You're successful in education when there's awards. I always like to look at the Apple Educator Awards to see who has won those. Grants, there's a lot of websites now with the uh, donors. I think donors choose or go fund me, and that's ways that teachers are able to put out a request for something specific to get uh, money in to go ahead and do that project. And when those are funded, that's a sign of success. A request for partnership. So if there is a nonprofit that's looking for something and being able to have guest speakers come into the classroom, and if there's any kind of co authoring, I know one of the audio video production high school teachers in Austin wrote a textbook in terms of uh, workshops, uh, public speaking as well. I know that I'm successful as an educator when I contact Austin Community College, when I contact the Art Institute of Austin, and they say, yes, Mr. Getz, we'd love to have you come in and speak to our students. In each case, it was probably about 25, 30 students that, that I was speaking to. Success in content production comes from income, making money doing it, a sense of pride of having something that you've done that looks good, and if it has lots of views. Now, the way this kind of shakes out for shooting wedding video is wedding video may not have, it may not have a ton of views, but it looks great because I use the proper equipment and there's a budget for it. But in terms of having lots of views, maybe not, not so much in terms of the views, but it's very important to the people who are in the video. And that's what I see as signs of success in producing content, in being an educator, and also being a salesperson. There's a complete other PowerPoint presentation I can do about the comparison between uh, sales and teaching, because I believe that in sales, it is a lot of teaching. And the entire time that I've been in sales, I feel that I've been selling ideas. So I've been selling the idea to to go a certain direction. I've been selling the total cost of ownership of purchasing equipment and then making someone feel comfortable to make the decision to move forward. So I feel that I've been in education much longer than these uh, two years that I've been deriving half of my income from teaching. Happiness is a mix of income. It's job satisfaction. It's also a sense of self. So how do I weigh my progress against how my boss sees it? Well, if you are your own boss, that's a situation where you're working for your clients. If 
you have students who are saying that they aren't progressing. How am I, therefore, uh, progressing as a teacher? So one of the one of the funny jokes is that a teacher might say, "Well, I I taught it, but they didn't they didn't learn it." Well, those two things kind of go hand in hand. So if my bosses are my students, when they're progressing, I'm progressing as well. And then what if a job is work and what if a job is fun? There may be some things that we think it'd be be great to go do and seeing photos of whether it's celebrities or seeing photos of film sets or seeing photos of people doing 3D modeling and and doing the motion capture with with clay models to make video games well there's a lot of that that's a lot of hard work and a lot of it is a real a real slog getting through but looking at what you think is fun means that you can bring enjoyment and that you can bring passion to your workaday life some of the time you will not be able to do it all of the time because there could be some there could be some haters or there could be some some problems that crop up. And uh, when those do, you will rely on your diversified happiness portfolio to 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 carry on. 2002 was Friendster. I skipped it. 2003 was MySpace. I got a invitation to join MySpace and I thought that it had come from the student radio station at the University of Texas. So when this came in, I saw it and I, I didn't know what it was, didn't really know anything about social networking. So I thought it had to do something with KVRX because that's, you know, maybe somebody from the radio station sent it over and the, and I didn't know what it was. Uh, but went ahead and joined, haven't updated it uh, in years now. But then LinkedIn came out in 2003. So that's a more professional networking site. In 2004, Facebook came out. That's around when I was at University of Texas. I think I signed on in late 2005. The reason I did it was because I had a .edu email address, and that's what you had to have originally to start. So Facebook, as made famous in the film The Social Network, uh, was started at Harvard and was at colleges before it ended up being opened up more to the public. 2005, YouTube came out. Uh, the first thing I looked up on YouTube was the cartoonist Don Hertzfeld, and I was just amazed of all the things that I could find on YouTube. Very quickly started putting uh, my own content up there, and then also putting up content for the employers that I worked for. Both Omega Broadcast and, and Texas Media Systems were I flat out at Texas Media System started the Vimeo page. I started the YouTube page there. But at Omega Broadcast, there was a little bit of that started already, but I definitely carried it forward uh, with pride and strength. And I don't think anybody <laughs> at either company has posted as many videos or has garnered uh, the total number of views that I have uh, before or since. Twitter came out during South by Southwest, I think in March 2006, and I only tweeted the first couple of years during South by Southwest because I didn't know the difference, didn't know what it was or why, something else to update, and quickly realized the difference between a handle and a hashtag. Anybody can use a hashtag. A hashtag is kind of a way of traveling. A handle is, is a destination. Anybody can use a hashtag. Not anybody can use a handle to post as that person Person, but you can reference a person by using their handle. Instagram is a little bit, let's say a little bit higher rent of uh, photos. Uh, what people are looking for on Instagram is photographers, is, is fashion, is style, is, is content that is a little bit, people who are more invested in their photos go to Instagram. And something that I, I don't know if this has been changed or not, but there can't be any links in the comments. And I don't know if there can be links uh, somehow in the description as well, but I haven't experimented with it a lot. But what I, I want to go in and find out, maybe somebody can comment on this video here and post some directions to, to how to put a link in Instagram. Because typically when I have links on forums or on YouTube or on Twitter, what that means is somebody can click on it and go to what I'm talking about. So six years after Facebook came out, the film The Social Network came out, and it talked about how Facebook was started and everything surrounding that launch. And very interesting that we could be ready for The Social Network 2 uh, now because it was six years since Facebook came out, and now it's been eight years years uh, since the film The Social Network came out. So this is a little bit of, of kind of what's out there so I can jump into my next topic, which is branding. Who are you? 
there's Google accounts. And what are you using them for? There's YouTube accounts. There's Google Docs. So you can create a document, pretty much a Word document, share it with somebody else, and you both can be editing and making changes to it. And when, when you're in an educational environment or when you're working on computers that are not yours, look at what account you're logged into. Log out of everything when leaving a computer. You do not want to comment as your employer when you are on YouTube. And you also don't want to be uh, watching videos or liking videos as your employer because you have to think about what hat you have on at that time. Who are you? Who are you working for? And and what is your brand? So sometimes I had had different web browsers. So I would have Internet Explorer, I'd have Chrome, and then I'd also have Firefox or Opera. And I would log into different social media accounts, whether it was my personal building my own brand, or whether it was my employer, or whether it was Three Point Production, which is the, the production company uh, that uh, my wife and I founded. I have your passwords written in a safe place. I think a couple of years ago, I started to write down usernames and passwords and different websites, forums, apps, because I started forgetting uh, what all I had going and what all I was involved in. What do you use the YouTube channel for? So what do you use your YouTube channel for? Think about it. If there's one brand, if it's to promote yourself, it's to promote your work, I think the best thing to start with is a demo reel. Uh, so a little bit about uh, yourself, a little bit about your work. And the most important thing with the demo reel is to say what role you had in the different projects you're showing. It's one thing to show a photo of a film set that you see downtown. But if you did not have a role in that film set, the goal is not to show that you can walk somewhere and go see a, a, a film set. The goal is to say that this is something that I had worked on and this is the specific thing I did with it. One of the forums that I use is uh, DVinfo, also DVX users. And you have to love the hate mail. So there will be comments that come in, but understand that you control the content. So you can control what comments are on your page. So if there's a comment that you don't like, you can go ahead and, and delete that comment that you don't like. And you have to have thick skin. And I learned this from in 2005, I made a DVD that was about the staple independent media convention that came to Austin. And PVP is a comic made by a guy named Scott Kurtz. And this is something that, that Scott had said in terms, of, in terms of loving the hate mail. Who are you? You are a student. Your profession is being a student. That's what takes your time. And that's what you are doing. And what does success or satisfaction look like to you? When are you done with the project? How do you get feedback on your work? I know it's, you get a grade on it. I know uh, the goal is to graduate. But what is, the, what is the passion that drives you to create content? One of the things that I thought about is it's kind of best to, to study what you're interested in and then this kind of opens up audio video production to lots of different majors who may not not major in it. But if you're interested in sports, there's areas in sports that require video. If you're interested in religion, faith-based, community building, then there are ways to use audio video production in, in those areas as well. I had a guest with me when I spoke at the Art Institute and also at Austin Community College, and that guest was Mr. Ryan White from Rode Microphones. And Rode is known for making lots of different things, but the first product that I knew them for was the NTG2, which is a shotgun microphone, uh, sells for between two and $300. They also have a full set of microphones that work with phones, tablets, mobile devices. They have microphones that are good for studio use, for field production. Actually, I bought their wireless lavalier, which is a tie clip microphone that is wireless. And at this point in the presentations that I gave, I turned it over to Ryan White to talk about his background, to talk about how he had gotten his start in the production and technology industry. And then when he got done talking, he bounced it back to me. So I thought about 
making this the first slide, but what I wanted to do first was to talk about my background, talk about where I was coming from, have him talk about his background a little bit, because what that does is gives a little bit of credibility to the speaker, so that way the students would have a little bit of an understanding of why they should be listening or why they should even be in the room at all. Technology is what we talked about. You see number one there. We talked about technology, which is Rode and their microphones. Then I also talk about the technology I've worked with. Talk about motivation. So why do something as opposed to nothing? Anybody's life and their days minute by minute are made up of this decision between should I do A, should I do B? Should I do A, should I do B? And when looking at content creation and at media creation, why are we doing what we're doing? Or why are we not doing anything? Or who's motivating us? Am I motivating myself? Is it motivation from a grade? Is it motivation from money? Is it motivation to keep a business or an idea uh, moving on into the future? What's the budget? Number three, so the production budget. If you are a student, you probably have lots of time, but maybe not a lot of money. And when doing a, a multimedia production or a creative production, whether it's recording a song, whether it's recording a prank video on YouTube, those things take time. Uh, they probably do take a little bit of money, but what we're going to see is that these endeavors, the budget is made up of both of those things, and they should both be considered. What equipment are you using now? This is the point where I say, raise your hand if you have a phone. Okay, so you have a phone. You can record video and audio on your phone. That's the first thing to start with. After that, go to a camcorder. A camcorder is great because you can take production stills on your phone or record additional audio when you have the camcorder going. You'll be able to record video without tying up your phone. So if you have any notes that are on your phone, if you have any uh, set direction or any uh, interview questions that you want to ask, those can be on your phone, and then the camcorder is doing the recording. So then the video from the camcorder will get put onto a computer and then edited. A DSLR comes next, that's a digital single lens reflex. So I have a post that's out there about first movers in, kind of in 2008, about Nikon, Canon, Casio, about who really had the first DSLR that shot video. And a DSLR looks like a still camera, but it shoots video. There's manual settings on these. So it's a little bit more difficult than just a camcorder where you hit record and go. So in terms of being mo most difficult, the log workflow and also the raw uh, workflow. So log with the video, it's baked into the video to provide a certain look. And that look maximizes what the sensor is doing, but in post-production, you have to remember to reverse the log through a LUT, which is a lookup table, and that really gives you the best image that you can get out of your camera. But the thing about it is when you're monitoring or when you're in the field, when you're actually doing your production, the image looks chalky, somebody looks over your shoulder, they're like, what in the heck are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. Or if you pass the video off to somebody, they don't know that there's log applied to it. There's some considerations where if you don't think your project is gonna make it all the way through the pipeline in a way that uh, you can manage, just don't shoot log. RAW is huge files, so that's everything off the sensor. So what happens is, is if you shoot RAW, you have the ability to create any kind of look from that that you want to, but it's very data intensive. And one of the crutches with it is, oh, we'll shoot RAW and then fix it in post. Well, there needs to be decisions that are made throughout the production at certain times, and if if you really don't know if you have a have a colorist working with you, you don't know if you have uh, who's going to be editing your project, it's going to be, a, and don't have the hard drive space, you may not want to shoot uh, raw. But these are all considerations when it comes to one thing, and that's picking a camera. Start off on auto. So how many people on their phone are able to actually do different settings on their phone to, to change what the, what the white balance is, the iris, the focus, depth of field, looking at ISO, which is kind of like the film uh, stock of the camera. What are you setting the shutter to? Shutter, when it is 
very high makes it look like the beginning of Saving Private Ryan when they're storming the beach. Everything looks very uh, uh, jagged and very uh, 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 jarring. There's also been uh, some some kind of high speed uh, sports uh, photography with if you picture kind of dirt, you know, coming off a cleat as a uh, soccer player is kind of or as a football player is kind of turning, right? Or um, those those could be things that are uh, a high shutter rate, and then also frame rate. So there's the slow mo guys are out there. Uh, Sony had their FS seven hundred camera that came out years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago, that shot 960 frames per second. It's kind of fun to shoot on the Panasonic GH4 to set that guy to do 96 frames per second, drop it into a 24p timeline, and your video is 25% full speed without any conforming, without any without any kind of a, a post-processing. Lots of fun can be had with, with the frame rate. You want to be intentional about high shutter speed. I worked on the show that ended up becoming Friday Night Tykes and worked on it. And the producer kind of said what the camera should be set to. And then they kept talking about, oh, if you want to mess with shutter speed or if you want to change the shutter speed. And it's like, I, I, and I didn't know why it was so important at the time. And then what I realized was the different things that were being shot, different shutter speeds can be used as a stylistic effect. But one of the main things that you look at is kind of what your shutter speed is compared to your frame rate. And you want to have your shutter speed be twice what the frame rate is for the most sharpness. DOF, depth of field, that's just how much of the frame is in focus. So the reason I mention any of this, and you may not consider yourself being a director of photography, you may not consider yourself working with cameras, uh, but you might like to know the rules and the skills before you push the boundaries or before you straight up break the rules. Is a camera a toy or is a camera a tool? Are you going to beg? Are you going to borrow? Are you going to rent? Uh, what do you have? What's, what's in your toolkit? So you may have an iPhone. You may have a video camera. You may have a video camera at school uh, or at a church or community center. Is there a computer you can edit on? There may be one at all the above named places. A white, black, and gray card. If you have your camera set to manual white balance, if you take a shot of these three cards you're able in post-production to apply color correction to say, okay, this is white, okay, this is black, okay, this is 18% neutral gray. One of the reasons I like shooting weddings is because the bride and the dress is typically my white balance, and the groom in uh, his black tux is typically uh, the black balance for the camera. And then I just really need 18% gray. Uh, that's all I really need. But when I'm shooting details and things on uh, decorations or tables or guests arriving or wide shots, there's different shots that I do get where I do need to have all three of them. A variable ND, uh, South by Southwest 2013 was when there were a lot of people with DSLRs and shooting with a DSLR. When you're shooting video, your shutter speed can't go through the roof. So your shutter speed can be super high when shooting stills, it's fine, but it can't be super high when shooting video. What you need to do is be able to clamp down on the light. So you need to be able to have uh, less light and then with that less amount of light, you're able to have a longer shutter speed, which makes the video look more smooth or properly exposed either way. Motivation. Why do anything? Why continue to uh, watch this video or to, to listen to Mr. Getz? I do production that looks good. I do production that's widely seen, so it gets lots of views. I also do production that pays. Something that looks good and is widely seen, camera test videos. So when I can get my hands on a camera that is just about ready to start shipping, I know that people are gonna watch the video because they've never seen anything shot on this camera. I've got a couple of videos that have 5,000 plus views, and it is uh, me taking a camera out, shooting some different things, putting it on YouTube, and then putting a link to download the footage that I recorded. Also, something that looks good and that pays, uh, that is an example of a, a wedding video. It looks great using the proper equipment, get paid for doing it, may not be widely seen, but that's one of the things that, these are three of the things that I bring to any situation. So why am I doing this video right now? So this video I'm doing right now, does it look good? Well, it's a narrated PowerPoint. 
Uh, is it widely seen? Uh, we'll we'll see if it if it gets some clicks, if it generates uh, some discussion or feedback. If anybody found it helpful, what it made anybody think of? Does it pay? Well, in a couple hours here, I'm going to be going across the street to the house that I'm renovating to start doing flooring uh, with uh, my brother-in-law, and it, that doesn't pay. This doesn't pay. Um, so I guess I really shouldn't be doing this. But it is something that's very important to me in terms of education, in terms of creating educational content. I think that this is a good time to record this video while the presentation is fresh in my mind. These PowerPoint slides that I put together that I brought into the schools that I spoke at is a culmination of my work as an MBA student working on my master's of business administration at Concordia, Texas. Had a lot of notes from there that I used. I have notes from when I went and spoke to a filmmaking group at the University of Texas uh, years ago. And those notes are all kind of moving towards, moving towards uh, creating content and it's helpful to people and that I can, can use as teaching examples or that I can use as becoming a trusted advisor as a sales representative of Videotech Systems. Motivation continued. There shouldn't be anything stopping you from making videos. You are in Austin, Texas, or very close to Austin, Texas. And the thing about the thing about Austin is what Richard Linkletter did 20 years ago, what Robert Rodriguez did 20 years ago. And that is if you were to take a yellow highlighter to the Austin Chronicle and highlight every time somebody said they couldn't do something or something changed or or I'm going to I'm going to shoot this project when I have this when I have that those are all excuses there shouldn't be anything stopping you from making videos what do you need help with what don't you have access to what are you thinking through that makes sense to motivate you to finish your project what projects are you working on? What are you doing? Why are you doing these things? Not to beat you up for, for why are you doing these things? You should be doing something different. I know better, blah, blah, blah. It's not that at all, but it's to, to understand uh, what, what you're doing and how your community can help you, whether it's your teacher or your classmates. What are the options for using these tools when you get out of here? For crying out loud, if, if somebody doesn't buy an edit system in the neighborhood, then you are not really going to have access to the, the school equipment after you graduate. So think about what are the options for using these tools when you get out of school. Now, understand that I was speaking to college students at this time. A lot of this applies to the other K through 12 grade levels as well. What can you help somebody with? So that's kind of, if you have a, a board set up in the classroom, and on one side it says, things I can help with, and on the other side it says, things I need help with, and it's beginning to, to match those things up. Production is no fun lots of times to do by yourself. So production is something that if you have somebody that's holding the boom mic for you, or if you have an, another set of eyes, because when you're working with interviewing somebody, you're pretty focused on the interview, you're, you're thinking about what that person is saying, and what you might miss is something in the background that's messing up the shot, or maybe the look space is wrong, the person's kind of looking in the wrong direction, but having another set of eyes, somebody to come in and just glance over and say, oh yeah, make this here, do this, and, and, and when that happens, you'll say to yourself, oh my gosh, that really... You know, it really made the made the production better. So that is helping somebody else out. Give all the different roles a try and see what sticks. I know there's some people that may not want to be on camera. They may, may not want to uh, be talking on camera, have their image and likeness shared. There's lots of regulations and rules in terms of, of privacy and in terms of media release uh, sign-offs because you can't just go around with the camera and record things and uh, put it all online. There's something kind of about being a good digital citizen, but giving the different roles a try means to give talent a try. Try to do a news report. Try to do a weather report. Uh, try to be an interviewer. Work the boom pole. Try editing. It may not be something that you're going to do extensively, but it could be something uh, that you can help somebody else with and have a little bit more of a uh, a diverse set of skills because when you're applying for jobs or when you're looking for freelance work, you, it, you may be surprised what the things are that somebody sees in you as a candidate and that's something they want that's something they need if you got that experience that means you can fill that role 
Being tall is helpful when you're shooting video. If you're six foot six and you stretch your arms up and you can reach like eight, eight and a half feet, that means you can hold your camera over a crowd. You can climb up a ladder. There's things you can get off of a top shelf. You can adjust a light without a ladder. Uh, there's many things. But being short doesn't mean you can never do video. So there's things that are going to be an asset that you'll have to anticipate when you're on set, and being tall is one of them. Being clumsy is not helpful when shooting video. There was a podcast I was listening to uh, driving one day from No Film School, and they were talking about if there's uh, things that people can do that students can do to make themselves better to to work in media creation professionally. And then it was, well, there's some things that won't help you. And if you were clumsy, it's not the end of the world. But if you drop a camera or if you typically misstep or don't judge distances or sprain your ankle, you may not want to be a director of photography. And again, I say this totally with a grain of salt because there's ways that people have overcome things. I, there was a student years ago who came in to do a voiceover for me for a video that I was doing, and he had a speech impediment. And what I couldn't believe is that he also had a, a radio show on KVET. Um, so he was a professional broadcaster and Today, he, he's a pastor. Um, but when I had heard that, when this, when he came in to do this voiceover, I was like, what is happening here? But he had a great voice, um, but was a little bit was a little bit rough in terms of the delivery, uh, but he was able to overcome it. So these are general tips. I mean, you don't have to apply all these rules all the time. You can apply some of these rules some of the time. And some of these things that I'm talking about may not apply at all, which is fine. We talked about the budget. So the budget's made up of two things. It's made up of time. It's also made up of money. Teamwork. Who has what? If you invest in all the equipment, it's not fun sometimes. Don't go out and buy a lighting kit, buy a sound kit, uh, buy a camera, uh, buy an edit system. Don't go out and get all that stuff. So what I would recommend, and I mentioned a little bit of this before, is is working alone isn't fun sometimes, but if you specialize and have your friends specialize and then you hire each other, that's really a recipe for a success. So if there's one person who's strong in camera, that means they bring the camera. If there's somebody who's strong uh, with lighting equipment, that means grab the lighting kit from that person. If there's somebody else with an audio rig, grab the audio from that person. And then if there's somebody who has an edit system, okay, I own an edit system. I don't own a professional camera. I've got some cameras that are good for shooting around the house, shooting shooting family video, shooting my three-year-old son uh, with, that, with that camera. But I've got an edit system. I don't have a camera. I've got a little bit of audio equipment, and I have one on-camera light. So I looked at what I can rent to do production, what I could uh, beg or borrow uh, to do production. And it just seemed to me I didn't want to have a camera sitting here and then have to go over to somebody else's house to edit. It was like, okay, I need to get an edit system. So that was the first thing that we got as three-point production and then added a few things to the toolkit over the years. But really, I haven't had a camera payment. I haven't, had, haven't bought a lot of audio equipment and haven't uh, bought a lot of, of lighting either. But the biggest thing is specialize and have your friends specialize and work with each other. You may be thinking, I'm never going to be shooting video as a career. Any company out there or any brand you work for will have a public image to maintain. Even Quaker Oats, even Heinz Ketchup, even the uh, law firms, dental uh, dentists, and they have a public image to maintain. There's content that they need. Though you may not be working directly in media, it's good to have a literacy of how these images are produced and how to produce content that looks good and sounds good. And you may be at a company where there are some of these things that are produced on site. There could be um, a, a group that if it's outsourced, somebody else comes in to do this content. You may want to keep an eye on how that's being created, see what the final content is, then look at the brand, the company you work for, and see how it aligns, how it doesn't fit, and what feedback you have, and go ahead and give that feedback. And the next thing you find out is 
somebody higher up in the company may tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we would really like to have you around the next time we go to do something like this. It could potentially happen. And social media is also important. So it's no longer you have to have a motion picture film camera to do video. Um, there are uh, video cameras, of course. Uh, and then there's a complete spectrum from something super simple as a tweet to something as extensive as a a motion picture, a feature film, I think that's pretty much the gamut of, uh, of how wide it is in terms of, of, of what media is out there. But there really is a great range of it. And to, to look at what, what parts of it are interesting to you or uh, what parts of that spectrum that you want to be a credible uh, professional content creator in. And I could also say that all of it starts with good writing and good planning and that you may not want to create any content at all and just solely focus on uh, uh, script writing, on planning, and a little bit of the, uh, the business of it. So there's a business aspect to what's being, what's being produced and what the, the payoff could be for the content that's being created. There's a public relations angle to it as well. There's even high-speed video production for manufacturing processes to, to see how the different uh, robots are basically building or creating or printing circuit boards to see where where mistakes are being made and then to fold that video back into the the programming routines that the robots are running off of and you may not be thinking what I'm thinking so I may go to the next slide what's out there camera op camera operator that's a job Equipment manager, if there's a lot of equipment at a facility, need to make sure it gets cleaned up, check back in, if something's been broken. Production manager, who's on set looking for things, we need to get an ice cream truck, we need to get a police cruiser, what are the different things that are needed during the production. There's editing, so that's being at a computer, and hopefully it's a stand-up desk uh, because uh, sitting all day long is no fun. Uh, is there somebody bringing in new business? So what's the sales department look like? How does your company get new clients? How does your company grow and to, to sell the products they have? Have. What's account management? So are the clients big? Are the clients small? How often do the clients purchase? Do you want the clients to purchase more? What is the marketing? How is the company seen and, and being branded on all the different social media platforms? As I said before, skip all of it. Just become a writer. Uh, graphic design. So doing layout. So doing uh, creative things in terms of what a website looks like or if there's uh, user experience. A lot of design comes into that. If you take that design, put it in motion, you're therefore a motion designer. There's lots in terms of, of legal uh, that's involved. I mentioned a little bit earlier about privacy. There's also uh, errors and omission. Uh, you can't shoot video anywhere. There are ways to, to shoot video in public places, but there's ways to do it right. Safety is always a concern. There is lots of ways to, to take the legal uh, uh, route towards approaching media production. Different vertical markets I mentioned a little bit. In some small towns, the only place where there's a PA system and a, a set of lights and a stage and a theater is the church. In, in big cities, the media that churches are creating now is in 4K. Uh, the media they have is, is 4096 by 2160. It, it, looks, it looks great. And the churches are definitely a part of... of of communication revolutions because churches historically have been at the cutting edge of it. If you go back and even look at uh, printing presses uh, in the 1500s and uh, uh, parchment and uh, literacy uh, at those times. There's also the market of education, uh, which is something that I focused on uh, quite a bit. And that means that schools uh, need media, schools need educational content. There are educational YouTube videos that these web pages or these YouTube pages are being monetized uh, quite well. Uh, sports, uh, Flow Sports is right here in Austin, and they look at a little bit of the mid list in terms of sports. So not the not the men's football, not the not the baseball. So they look at uh, softball, tennis, swimming. They look at sports that that people are competing in these sports more often than every four years when the Olympics happens. So there is there's there's team handball. There are, are sports that are going on where the athletes are very much invested. There's some brands that are invested. The competition is absolutely fierce. And what Flow Sports is doing is, is shooting video of that because there are fans uh, for those sports. The people who are in the sport, obviously, the brands that are supporting the sports are looking at, 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 at what the competition is. But 
track running, I mean, wrestling. So Flow Sports is a great uh, vertical market. And then sports could also be uh, brought into uh, education as well. So whether it's a whether it's a sports team at a school, lots of churches have gyms. Uh, the gym could have a live music event. So there's these four big spheres I thought I'd throw out there to kind of look at a vertical market to to kind of provide a little bit of direction uh, when you start to to look at different places media is being used and maybe uncover something you didn't even know about, something that was uh, pretty close to your neighborhood or something you hadn't thought about going and looking into when it comes to to media and content creation. There's lots of free opportunities to see technology and to network. I just threw out a couple of them here, but I think there's there used to be, I think the the, the Twitter page was called Unknown City. I don't remember, or, or Free Austin or Free whatever. So there, there's things that can be done for free. Again, it's not spending money to go out and do these things, but in March, South by Southwest has a great trade show. There are ways to get one-day passes for free to the trade show through exhibiting manufacturers. I exhibited at the trade show three years in a row with Omega Broadcast, and before that, I volunteered on the new media crew, so I was shooting video of a lot of the different panels, panel discussions that were happening, was on the edit crew, editing those videos and watching people eat up that content. Uh, met Shaquille O'Neal one year, went back through my Twitter feed and actually found a photo of me with Shaq. Uh, so that's a great story in and of itself uh, to talk about. And that is a little bit of what multimedia production, filmmaking, the music industry, quote unquote, the biz. Um, there are kind of some celebrities uh, in it. There is a lot of talent, uh, talented personalities obviously. And talking about that is something that it isn't the main reason for doing it, but it's something that is fun to mention uh, because that it it can't happen. I mean, you're you're typically doing events like this in the right place. It's typically the right time uh, uh, for seeing folks like that, but isn't it isn't for me uh, the driving force of it. So I'm definitely not a a, a TMZ hound and a, a a paparazzi hound in terms of uh, uh, looking at um, what celebrities are doing. In May, the production roundup takes place in Dallas, and that's put on by Videotex, and that's a company I work for now. And coincidentally, in, I think, 2010, when I was with Texas Media Systems, the first trade show that I had the pleasure of doing uh, ever and when I was with Texas Media Systems was the production roundup uh, up in Dallas. So that's going to happen in May. And I think this past year on Craigslist, I threw something out there to see if some people wanted to carpool, uh, you know, get a group coming from uh, uh, San Antonio heading up there, then see about getting a group from Austin heading up there as well. And then in August is the Texas Association of Broadcast uh, Trade Show. It's typically been at the Arboretum um, at the uh, Renaissance Hotel. I believe the event's gotten pretty big, so it's going to be moved uh, for 2018. Not quite sure where it's moving to. But I thought I'd mention these as, as things that are out there to go take a look at. In 2002, I attended the National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Las Vegas when I worked for Concordia University. And I and the, the morning when I was there, I, I wanted to go down every single aisle. Like that was something I wanted to do. And there's maybe 10,000 exhibitors, or there's thousands of exhibitors, maybe 5,000 exhibitors. So, I mean, it's huge. It's in many different gigantic exhibition halls. But I walked over one one floor, and it was a lot of uh, uh, RF and, like, pipes and, like, uh, broadcast antennas and things I didn't, didn't really like that much. So I took a break, and I ate lunch, and I was like, what am I doing here? Why? I don't understand. This, this is boring. Well, what I didn't realize was there was another complete floor to the building that I was in. And I went down this escalator. I'll never forget it. I went down this escalator and I started seeing brands that I knew. Canon, Sony, Epson, Edderall, Roland. And when I got down and walked around, I, I said to myself, this is, I love this. I love trade shows. I love technology. love the equipment. And it wasn't another four years until I started uh, working for a company selling all that equipment that I'd seen at that time. Because from 2002 till uh, 2005, I was still employed at Concordia University, uh, working in information technology and working in the TV studio there. So this is the last slide. 
but is by no means the end of the conversation. So places you can look for me is I work for Videotex, and there's a handle there, T-E-X. I forgot to say that. I kept saying Videotex, and you may have been thinking T-E-C-H-S, and you've been Googling it, and, and you dislike me now because this is an hour now that this, this thing has been going on. At Philip Getz, you see that there. And then I guess there was another Philip Getz on YouTube where I didn't really stick the landing on my brand. So this is a little bit of a fail. Um, so kind of think about if you have a pseudonym or think about uh, something that you can get the, uh, get the dot .com uh, on. I have uh, philgets.com is where I have some things. But uh, for YouTube here, Philip gets the number one. Uh, what that turns into is sometimes when I write it on a board or uh, write it on a board or handwrite it for somebody, they go P-H-I-L-I-P-G-O-E-T-71. And then I have to go back and say, oh, no, it's, it's a Z. Uh, no, it's not. It's not 21. And I really appreciate you uh, taking some time to uh, to listen through this. I thought it was a good uh, time and place. It, it's January 2nd, uh, 2018, so kind of a new year and a good, uh, uh, good time to bring all this content uh, to the foreground, present it to people, and see where the conversation uh, goes from there. Thank you again.